Institute for Public Knowledge and the GovLab at NYU today for this event. For those of you who are new to the IPK, we are a social science institute at NYU that supports communications between researchers and broader publics around major public issues. Our working groups consist of graduate students and professors from within NYU, as well as members of business, nonprofit, and academic arenas and the university. Members collaborate to write papers, host conferences, and meet regularly to discuss their individual projects. If you're interested in learning more about our working groups in general or the Future of Democracy Working Group, come see me, Jessica Coffey, the Associate Director of IPK, after the lunch. The next event in our series will take place on Monday, October 8th at 6 p.m. with Cesar Hidalgo of MIT and Jose Luis Marti of Pampu Farba speaking on artificial intelligence and democracy. Visit our website for additional details and to RSVP. I will now pass the, the mic to Beth Simone Novak, one of the leads of the Future of Democracy uh, working group and the director of GovLab here at, at NYU. She will introduce our guest today, Jeff Mulgan. Thank you, Jessica, and I want to just thank the whole team at IPK for hosting this lunch and this whole series. I think we can all agree it's actually what we would call in my old university NPL, non-pizza lunch, which is very much appreciated uh, that it is, it's quite a bit beyond non-pizza lunch. So I think, um, uh, Jeff, it's all, everything is gravy that you do from here since the food, the food is so good. So thank you very much. Um, this is the second in a series that began last week with an evening talk by Audrey Tang, uh, Digital Minister of Taiwan, that we are using to explore, again, the future of democracy. I think we can all agree that the time is ripe, especially as we face an election around the corner, uh, and that we are deeply worried about the current state of our democracy. We are, like most Americans and most people around the world, 43% around the world, a much lower number in America where fewer than 5% of people actually trust and believe that government, especially at the federal level, that government can do what's right most of the time. That number is getting so low, we're not going to be able to measure it soon anymore. So whether it's what happens during election season or what happens the day after it, we have deep and grave concerns about the erosion of our democratic values and nowhere so more than here. However, the purpose of this series is not to bemoan the present state, quite as much, we can do a little of that, but is actually to talk about what comes next and to talk about what may be possible, particularly through the application of new technologies, but also new forms of governance and other mechanisms by which we can actually reinvigorate our democratic institutions, our governance institutions, and in the process possibly also reinvent what we understand to be the meaning of democracy. Something that may be thicker, more ascriptive, stronger than simply voting in elections once a year. So I'm very delighted today on behalf of IPK and the GovLab, an action research institute here at NYU that focuses on innovations in governance, um, to welcome Jeff Mulgan, my good friend and collaborator, who is the CEO of Nesta, which is the UK's innovation foundation. For those of you who don't know Nesta, and you should, Nesta uses investment, practical innovation, and research uh, in countries around the world to promote innovation for the common good. Jeff has a very long bio, which I won't reiterate the whole of, but I'll just say that prior to being the CEO of Nesta, he was also the head of the Young Foundation, and prior to that, from about 97 to 2004, served in various roles in government, including as head of policy and head of strategy uh, for the Prime Minister's office, um, and he has served several Prime Ministers in the UK. Jeff has been a visiting professor at many places, LSE, UCL, Melbourne. He's a fellow at Harvard and a close collaborator with the GovLab as part of our MacArthur Research Network on Opening Governance. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in addition to his many books that he's written, Jeff has most recently published this phenomenal book, Big Mind, hopefully which we will hear a bit about today, which focuses again on these new opportunities that technology creates to leverage collective intelligence to further democracy. So before I turn it over to Jeff, let me just say that each of you will find on your chair, uh, if you haven't come, if you sit up, uh, you'll see that underneath you uh, is a quick statement that was prepared by 20 of our collaborators 
called the Crowd Law Manifesto. 20 of our research collaborators from around the world who prepared this statement of 12 principles precisely about the use of collective intelligence to improve lawmaking, to improve policy making. If you are a, in agreement with the principles, we would ask that you sign on uh, at the URL that's here. 62 organizations in the last week and 150 some, how many? Some number, close to 150, I can't see, um, uh, have actually signed the manifesto. And thanks to those signatures which have come in in the last week since the International Day of Democracy on September 15th, uh, we just learned that uh, the city council, a city council member in New York is now introducing the crowd law principles into the new city charter reform. Um, so it has real effect, the idea that citizens should be able to participate more in the life of our democracy. So, okay, end of promotional moment. Uh, and with that, let me turn it over to Jeff and invite you to uh, take the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for coming. Would you like this one, that one? Well, good, good afternoon, and thanks, Beth, for um, uh, the invitation. We've learned a huge amount from you and your colleagues, uh, and thanks to IPK. In, if there was a sort of utopian future, the world would be full of places with the names like that. So I, I sort of been, I'm deeply envious of you having the chance to uh, work in this way. I, I, most of my, my, my life is much more uh, mundane. Um, what I'm going to talk about, partly because of, I'm assuming, a, a pretty you know, knowledgeable audience, I'm going to air some, some, some challenges as well as some ideas uh, to really kick off a conversation about how we design uh, future democracy uh, I won't talk, as Beth said, about how we protect from returns to feudalism, authoritarianism, and so on, all of which uh, are highly uh, plausible. And really, just to focus on this very simple um, question, which uh, animates me, is you know, how does a democracy essentially amplify the best of the society it serves, not the worst? And we've seen quite a bit of the worst, but I think also we are, in many places, seeing some of the best. And it's a question which we used in a conversation which is a rather odd state in the UK, where the British Parliament, um, which is not in fact the world's oldest, but sometimes claims to be, the Icelanders got there long before, um, in the next few years is going to spend about, I guess, be seven or eight billion dollars physically refurbishing itself. Uh, they're redoing the carpets and the curtains and so on. Uh, which is all fine, you know, interior decor has its place in democracy. But we're trying to say to them, well, why not use a little bit of that money to actually um, use digital tools to, to show what democracy could be like in the future. We haven't yet quite persuaded them, but I'm an ever the optimist think that we will have an interesting case study um, of applying, you know, reasonable sums of money to enhancing how parliaments work. So one of the sort of the backdrops for the discussion, again, with them is to point out that there have been previous periods of incredible innovation in democracy. In the 19th century, you know, all sorts of things were invented. This is, again, the historians will know, the Aust Australia claims we invented the secret ballot. And this is a picture of one of the first secret ballots in Australia. I think there's a bit of controversy. But it's only in the 19th century, you know, the, the, many of the modern forms of parliaments and parties and platforms and manifestos and hustings were essentially invented and crystallized and spread, uh, including to many countries like Taiwan, where it was assumed they couldn't work for cultural reasons. Uh, and yet the oddity is we haven't seen much really widespread innovation since you know, the 1890s. I've had a... Um, Jump over Bismarck, actually. Um, I've had some slightly painful experiences of attempts to innovate. So I, I was uh, you know, working in around 10 Downing Street, which introduced you know, e-petitions, I guess 15 years ago or so. And uh, you can probably all guess what was the first most popular e-petition. It was that the prime minister should immediately resign. Uh, and uh, in a way, some of these tools, they have their place, but they often amplify uh, rather unhealthy sides of sort of megaphone politics, non-deliberative, non-reflective, rather than the best. At the other extreme is fiction. Has anyone in this room read this book, Gnomon? So I really recommend this. This is a, it's a big fat book by a sci-fi writer, but in a way gives a more, 
I think it's a richer vision of future democracy than anything I've read coming from, as it were, other sources. And essentially his future vision is a world where every decision is made by sort of citizens' juries of about 200 people in very sophisticated, transparent ways, really embedding um, this deliberative decision-making in a, in a public. And it's, it's a very interesting book about, about data uh, and about democracy and the future. And probably it's easier to do through a fictional format than through non-fiction. So anyway, that's recommended. So only out a few, uh, a few months ago. So I'm going to kick off just by saying a little bit about... Um, uh, the collective intelligence angles on democracy, and then I'm going to open up a few as essentially design questions, which I think need to be answered by anyone who aspires to be a designer of future democracy. And I hope this will, that will stimulate the, um, the conversation. Crudely, the sort of question behind this book is how can any kind of collective, any group, uh, an organization, a city, a university, uh, think at scale and have some more of the properties of what most of the time takes place in our individual brains, which is a sort of integrated synthetic ways of thinking, which combine observation, memory, creativity, wisdom, judgment, as well as folly, idiocy, and all the other things we do. Uh, but hopefully we get the good and not the bad. And um, uh, as I say, there's, there's, there's a lot that leads to, but one of the things I try and do is almost break up the different sort of functions of, um, uh, of, of intelligence either at the individual level or the collective level. And, uh, and it always has to have some combination of observation and data, live models of the world, analysis, memory, empathy, uh, and, and so on. And one of the design questions for democracy, you know, a good parliament, a good congress, how does it actually do these things and what are the tools available for it? And uh, there's an enormous, obviously, opportunities for new kinds of data input. A lot of what we're working on uh, at the moment and this afternoon and tomorrow with the UN is thinking through what are the new ways of thinking about governance in terms of bringing in not just formal public data, but citizen-generated data, sensor data, all the things which might give you an insight into improving child mortality or water, water provision, etc. I mean, often I think we're moving to try to make the models of the world of governments more explicit, more interrogatable, uh, whether in, in a monetary policy or infrastructure planning. Um, there's a whole body of work on analysis and predictive algorithms. I'll say a bit about, em about memory in a moment. Uh, empathy is crucial for governance. Uh, Robert McNamara, in his wonderful film, The Fog of War, which many of you will have seen, essentially says the biggest common mistake of governments and governance is a lack of empathy uh, a, 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 and so on. And uh, wisdom, in theory, resides in places like Supreme Courts, which is why your current nomination is rather important. Again, I'll, I'll make no comment on that. So anyway, one angle on democracy is thinking through what are, the, what are the new tools for these different things? And they are often very, very different in nature. So as I said, on the observation side, all sorts of new experiments. This is um, from um, Petter Jakarta, you know, citizen-generated flooding data, the kind you're very familiar with here, where uh, that is enhancing and combining with more traditional public data. A fascinating live case study in Canada in the next few weeks is their statistical agency is trying to measure cannabis levels in sewage. Uh, to um, provide a base, uh, a sort of benchmark or baseline rather for when it's legalized next month and they can tell different levels of legal and illegal uh, consumption but again, but also trying to get citizen input on price levels and so on. Fascinating live project. Uh, and of course democracies need memory as well. Can't probably see that but one of the reasons we've been creating you know, what works centers in fields like health and education and, and, and policing is to organize the, the collective memory about what or is, or is or isn't working as part of what any democracy needs to function. So that if you're having a, a debate or a discussion, at least the people taking part in it have access to the best available knowledge. Relevant to this place here, but often remarkably rare, despite the fact that in theory, you can just Google anything, it, it's still very most decisions made in most democracies don't make use of most available knowledge. 
and it's the kind of the paradox of our, of our times. So I'm not going to say much more about collective intelligence other than that about a week ago, uh, Beth was present when we, we did a sort of launch of a new center for collective intelligence design, which is um, based at Nesta, uh, which is looking at the practicalities of designing these sort of tools in fields like, um, like cancer care or labor markets or development. And we had some of the some very interesting democracy innovators there, like the people who've been uh, leading um, the Madrid project. And if you're interested, we will be sharing some of our mappings of you know, the different collective intelligence projects underway around the world, some very, very technology driven, some much more technology supporting face to face, some very complex collaborations, some very much simple contributions of data and so on. And we're also mapping the research field. Uh, and this is just an initial thing showing how the deliberative democracy, the research world is connecting or not connecting much to citizen science, crowdsourcing and others. So this is more if you're interested, do keep in, do, do get on the mailing list of the center because we will be doing much more of this since applying collective intelligence to collective intelligence, mapping uh, the state of play, what's growing, etc. And some of this is then feeding off um, the work we've done over the last few years on democracy, um, including uh, the development with a bunch of European partners of the dissent tools, uh, some of which fed into things like uh, Consul in the Cide Madrid, uh, in uh, Iceland, Finland, and elsewhere. And about a year and a half ago, we, we published a global survey of what we thought was happening in digital democracy in the examples like Taiwan, Korea, uh, Iceland, and trying to also be critical about what was or wasn't working uh, in them. So drawing on that, here I'm going to do a minute or two each on sort of six design principles. Um, which I'm sure are wrong, because I only did them just now for this talk, uh, but I hope we'll get a, uh, get a conversation going. And the first one is really prompted by the fact that I, and I suspect some of you in this room, are often sort of sent beautiful um, blueprints for future democracy, and particularly now ones using blockchain or whatever, and they're often intellectually very impressive, and the question is, what's wrong with them? And the simple thing which is wrong with them, I think, is that good democracy is always impure, contradictory, full of tensions, and, contradic and any pure proposals will fail. And I, I wrote a book about a dozen years ago called Good and Bad Power, which looked at the history of democracy. And any look at the history, you find this, this accumulation of different devices, um, as you obviously have in your constitution, uh, 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 but, uh, but are nearly always hybrids, they're assemblies, they're, they're, they're accumulations of different things uh, with different voting principles, different judgment principles, different accountabilities. And you can see this as a failure, a weakness, their inconsistency, but I see much more as a, as a strength of an emergent system will often grow up with these sort of inbuilt um, contradictions and tensions. And so my fear is any over, say, overly logical models, and there are many very logical models, for example, of com extreme, complete, direct democracy, or extreme, complete, you know, internet-based voting. Those are almost certainly roads to hell, not to heaven. And so the design challenge is how do you build in emergent evolutionary impurity rather than something which looks beautiful on paper? And one of the reasons we don't like necessarily, <laughs> these models is they're almost too pure in their, their power models. So secondly, and this may be obvious, but again, it's often missing from the, um, the, the, the pure accounts. Good democracy depends as much on what's outside the formal system as on what's inside. The informal constitution is as important as the formal constitution. This, in a way, has been the big lesson of the last 20, 30 years since 1989, as democracy spread to many more countries, it was a reminder it's not enough to have the formal institutions which look democratic if you don't have the media, the civil society, and so on. And some of those outside bodies are ones which probably many of you are involved in, the creation of new 
entities was observing politics, providing citizen empowerment. This is just one from Kenya, you know, tracking what, 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 what elected um, representatives are doing. How that, that is as much part of what makes that democracy work as anything within the parliament. Um, I think the street is often a really important part of democracy. So this is the, um, the, these are the pictures to sort of challenge Americans. Uh, this is Korea, uh, not that long ago, where the people took to the streets to get rid of a corrupt president. And uh, in the candlelight vigils in, in central Seoul, and that succeeded. That overthrew a, a, a president who is now in jail. Um, and uh, in every system, even when it's, again, formally democratic, at some points you need an extra democratic, extra parliamentary uh, process almost to, to reassert underlying values. Not much sign of it happening here. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we, we wait for these uh, similar scenes in, in DC. Um, and then there's, of course, fake news and the, the media environment around politics. It's very hard to see how you can have effectively functioning uh, politics without an effectively functioning media and social media. And uh, in the UK, you know, we, in the next few months, there will be a white paper on internet regulation, which scares some people. But a lot of that will be about you know, the responsibility of the platforms in respect of fake news, algorithms, recommendation engines, and so on. And there's a huge shift happening on that, where even two years ago, that was thought of as illegitimate. Uh, and now I think it's being driven in part by by the good side of democratic politics, because you cannot have a functioning democracy if your surrounding informational ecosystems are essentially spreading lies and falsehoods. So the third sort of design principle is, um, is really about detail. So again, it's great to have broad brush concepts, but I think the reason why um, the thing we, we get interested very quickly is the detailed design of processes turns out to be very important. It's not enough just to have the, the, the broad principles. So to, to, to explain what I mean, so some of you will be familiar with, uh, you know, in Iceland, your priorities, the Citizens Foundation. One of the detailed designs they did for their online tools was this simple principle of listing alongside each other you know, why you might support something, why you might oppose it, and having moderators who block ad hominem attacks, all the sort of things which are common in most social media. So you're required to, in a sense, respond to the other side's arguments, but not in a sort of shouting way. And that, is st that detailed design creates the possibility of a more thoughtful, deliberative, democratic space. Whereas different detailed designs would lead to a completely different culture of argument, shouting, and so on. And there are many examples of this, but uh, as I say, the crucial point is, is the detail. And one of the chapters in the book is about the detailed design of meetings, where I think there's a fascinating emerging science on different kind of meeting formats and what they lead to or don't lead to. Most democratic meetings um, breach almost everything that science tells us. So, for example, the public meeting absolutely empowers the extroverts, the most loud-mouthed, etc., uh, rather than, you know, the, the, the introverts, the thoughtful, etc. In, in many ways, the classic public meeting is a disastrous institution for doing democracy in its, in its, in its classic form, just as the parliament, like our parliament of two sides facing each other and shouting at each other, is a really bad way to get thoughtful, intelligent conversation. And anyway, there's a, there's a whole... You know, there's been an explosion of innovations around meeting formats, and one of the mysteries is still why so little of that has yet permeated democracy or academia. You can say in a university. The great majority of academic conferences I go to uh, have, uh, um, have not used any of that science, and occasionally when I'm being annoying, I ask people in universities uh, which, which science of meetings they use for designing their meetings. And I've yet, literally yet to have a single answer to that question. <laughs> I'm sure NYU is, a, is an exception, so I'll say no more. Um, fourth design principle, good democracy depends on different design principles for different stages of the democratic um, process. Um, and I, I'll show in a moment 
sort of a, a framework which we've used for several years now to try and make sense of the different stages of democracy from uh, you know, uh, framing, how you frame a question like air quality or, 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 or gun crime, uh, through to how you make proposals, how you scrutinize proposals, how you make decisions, how you, how you then act on them. So this is one example from the, the UK Parliament, which is at the level of um, gathering evidence before decisions, is beginning to crowdsource expertise uh, and making it easy for committees to tap into much more citizen expertise. That's a particular method used for a particular stage of the democratic um, process. Um, and, yeah. And so this, these, this is how we've thought of the different uh, stages, let's say, from framing, issue identification, options generation, option scrutiny, decision, implementation, and scrutiny of implementation. And the reason this matters is the methods you use, actually, I think, are different at every single stage. Um, in terms of how open they should be, in terms of whether you need to identify who is participating, um, whereas at some stages anonymity is probably okay, at other stages anonymity is not okay, uh, and um, a, a, a large proportion of the democracy proposals I see almost lump these all together and think they can all be done in the same way, and uh, I think that leads to problems. You had Audrey Tang here well, a week or two ago, and it's one of the reasons I like the V Taiwan approach as it evolves, but they almost started from recognizing that point, that the methods used for establishing the facts about an issue are different from the methods needed for getting you know, large-scale deliberation, understanding how people feel about things, or making sense of it, let alone the decision stage, which is much more by ministers and parliament in a classic way. So this seems to be exactly correct to be deconstructing democracy into multiple stages with different design principles, but which can together make an assembly which is smart and useful, etc. Um, then the fifth pr principle, which I'm, I, I, I've talked to Audrey about, and I'm not sure what she thinks quite, is whether good democracy depends on different design principles for different types of issue. And some people feel quite uncomfortable with this. But um, I, I, I'm fairly convinced of this. So there are certain kinds of issue, like, again, this is from Iceland, like uh, participatory budgeting on public space improvements, where these online tools work very, very well. And you can see the different options, how much they cost. You can vote. You can comment. That is the kind of issue which is very amenable to next generation democracy. Uh, what Paris has done with its 100 million participatory budget, again broken down by neighborhoods and with um, a, a 10 million euro for school kids to decide, fantastic example of civic education. That again works really well because it's mainly about things like public space improvements. But I think there's a kind of, there's, there's a way of mapping issues um, so this was a rough and ready version I did this morning, so it's not very good, uh, of different kind of issues where crudely this axis is meant to be mapping issues by how much they involve deeply held convictions, moral views of right and wrong, how the world works. And you know, there'll be an issue about the design of a public park, which is probably down here, and maybe issues around gay marriage might be up here. And then there's a Another axis, which is how much specialist expertise do you need to meaningfully take part in a, in a process? Uh, again, probably not that much for parks. And at the other extreme, you might have the design of monetary policy or the details of, uh, of trade negotiations, something we're in the midst of in the UK. So most of the collective intelligence tools for mass participation work really well here, as in Iceland and Paris but probably rather badly everywhere else on this space because if you, if you try and open up in the wrong way a highly charged moral question, you may actually increase polarization rather than um, uh, deliberation. And if you're trying to get the public to decide on highly specialized things, 
you will get you know, fairly random answers. And so for these sort of topics, the collective intelligence tools are probably much more about tapping into expertise to feed into decision making by representatives, perhaps in more classic ways. Uh, and up here, you need very different kinds of uh, a sort of national debate uh, promotion. So anyway, that's that, uh, I'd really love to hear all of your views of what's been learned over several decades about what kind of issue are amenable to what kind of design. And then finally, um, I think good democracy builds in a capability to evolve. In a way, that's what we think of almost every other field. We think in the economy, you have to build in you know, competition and market forces so your firms evolve. In science, there's all sorts of mechanisms which allow progress and evolution. Weirdly, democracy has none that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, uh, which is why, in a sense, having Chris taken crystallized form in the late 18th century or late 19th century or in some countries after the Second World War, those institutions essentially freeze and are very, very hard to reform. So I think there's a question for this whole debate. How would you build in, as it were, an endogenous capacity to change rather than requiring convulsive crises to change, uh, like you know, near revolutions or the citizens taking to the streets? You know, what should a modern democratic system have in terms of a formally established and formally funded R&D function for itself? That's the conversation we're trying to have with our parliament so that there's actually you know, budgets for running experiments, for, uh, for reviewing what, what's going on around the world, what models to be adopted or adapted. And that is completely alien to how they've been designed in the past, but I think is a crucial design principle for the future. And to reinforce that point, I'll end with a, a quote from Bertolt Brecht. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, it, it was talking about works of art, but I think it applies to democracy. How long do works endure as long as they are not completed, since as long as they demand effort, they do not decay? And I think that's true of democracy in many, many ways. It's partly a reminder democracy is a verb as well as a noun. If people don't work at it, it decays, it stagnates. But I think it also points to this deeper principle that having established a constitutional or a whatever, this should not be treated as, as, as a fixed in stone, immutable. It has to have a capacity for, um, for evolution uh, and, uh, and for being seen as incomplete. And that's in a way why this, this, this work is so important that you're all involved in. Because I think one of the reasons why democracy all over the world is in crisis, why there are declining proportions, particularly of young people who believe in democracy at all, why there's lots wanting to vote for authoritarian leaders is in part because the democracy they see hasn't evolved, hasn't kept up with the rest of their life, certainly hasn't kept up with technology, and therefore uh, loses legitimacy. So hopefully that's enough to stimulate, annoy, uh, at least get a conversation going about how we do design future democracy. And my, my, my final point is I suspect the the location for much of this work in the next few years will be in cities. I think we're seeing lots of cities with an appetite for experiment. 90 cities now using the console uh, tools, many others with a real appetite for uh, new ideas. In a few weeks' time, we have another event in Seoul with the Mayor Won Soon Park, who's been a champion of this. And in a sense, the question for, for all of you collectively is what, what advice do you give? How do, do those leaders who want to take to democracy to a next stage uh, succeed and make the fewest unnecessary mistakes? And that's where the academy should be able to help. Thank you. have a hashtag for the live stream in terms of questions from cyberspace? IPK. Okay. So for those people joining us on Twitter, we'll follow along to see if there's any virtual questions that come in. Hashtag IPK and otherwise for folks in the room. So the question I have is, this goes back to your first principle with regard to hybrid forms of democracy, right? Um, 
strongly agree on this point. And yet, partially in response to the political climate we find ourselves in, the uptake seems to be so much around the pure, pure forms of direct democracy, the desire to sort of replicate more and more forms of Even though we know they don't work very well, and governing demands very complex forms of decision making. But you and I both know the people very, very hard to convince otherwise. So maybe, maybe, maybe you have had more luck than I have, and I'm wondering what arguments you can give whether we see that as a necessary somehow first stage to go through in order to get to the place we want Yeah, I think this is exactly where, um, where the debate is. And uh, so five-star movements in Italy is a, is a really good example of this, which is now part of the government. It won the election there a few months ago and now shares power with uh, uh, the Lega. And they, uh, one of their founders, believed in a very pure version of direct democracy, highly influenced by kind of internet pioneers of the past who said, get rid of all hierarchy, get rid of all intermediaries, open up every decision to everyone clicking on buttons. And I think within Five Star, and as soon as they started running cities like Rome and Turin and their national government, many of them realized this was actually not a very smart way to run anything um, uh, because you often end up, uh, as indeed all referendums show, and my country has a current experience of this, you know, often with decisions which are, are, are not thought through, not deliberated, and which you regret as a, as a public. So the problem is, exactly as you said, Beth, that most authoritarian populists quite like a version of very direct democracy, which they can use, especially if they have media power, like a Putin, uh, to, um, to essentially to orchestrate opinion and to bypass challenging uh, other intermediaries. So in a way, many of the advocates in this space from the 60s onwards who advocated very flat internet-based direct democracy have become the problem, not the solution, because they are playing right into the hands of, in some ways, the most anachronistic, manipulative, authoritarian strands of, of politics. So we have to have quite a subtle uh, debate, and that's why I start with the question I, I put right at the beginning, what kinds of democracy amplify the intelligence of a society, not its stupidity? And, uh, and often the very direct click, like, not like, yes, no models, amplify stupidity, not intelligence. And almost any group of the public, when you take them through those issues, come to a pretty sensible uh, conclusions on that. Um, but there is this slightly unholy alliance of very old centralized power and new internet forms, which has become uh, the danger. So um, I don't really have an answer. Well, uh, who is to be persuaded? We do quite a bit of work with Five Star because we now have a uh, Nesta Italia uh, in, uh, in Turin, which works with, with them, and are trying to encourage them essentially to recognize that if you're in power, these sort of methods aren't very helpful long term because you will end up with decisions which you then have to implement and, uh, and destroy you, uh, which is roughly what's happening to government in Britain thanks to a referendum at the moment. But it's, 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 a, it's not a simple argument. I'd love to know anyone else who's got a good answer. Yeah, like you. I don't have an answer. I have a question. So let's wait till questions. <laughs> Has anyone got a good answer, better answer? Yeah, at the back, someone's got a really good answer to this question. I think the answer can be very simple. It can even be observed in rock and roll. How great are the Beatles? Who cares? Rock and roll was three chords, okay? Your story, you know, and that's it. Chuck Berry told you, roll over Beethoven, and tell Tchaikovsky the news. All right? Britain comes, and you know, I bet you can't da 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 da, and you have to ba 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 and shred like this, and that has nothing to do with the blues. That's why they can't play it. It's three causes, very simple. The American people, real American people, are very simple, 
And you're talking about intelligence versus stupidity. How dare you? Most people are stupid. I don't agree. They are. And maybe not in your country, but in America, the simple man. And one of the greatest songs is that I hope you be a simple man. Find a simple woman. Have a simple life. And when you talk simple, the people will understand that and respond. You sit here like you're a genius, and it's not going to work in America. And it's been proven. That's why they're releasing the Bible on a third grade level to get more people to the Christians. Everybody that speaks more simple, you may think Donald Trump is stupid or whatever, but maybe he's smarter than you. Because when you speak simple, the people respond, even the ones that are so-called geniuses. Well, all, all I'd say to that is for at least 200 years since in this country, and it was John Adams said that democracy always kills itself, uh, people have, mis uh, have underestimated the intelligence of the public. That has been the most common story of the last 200 years. Okay. Well, and we now know, certainly in, in most of Europe, you know, uh, half the public goes to a university and hopefully gets, you know, a certain knowledge of how the world works. But um, let's take some other, there's lots of people who have their hands up, so let's take a whole bunch, perhaps starting here and here and there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, I think on the question of referenda, like Brexit is an interesting example you brought up, although... I'm not sure if it's totally fair to just bring that up when Ireland um, recently legalized gay marriage and abortion through referenda. Um, also, Britain's vote to name the boat Bodie McBoatface was hilarious and a great name for a boat. Um, uh, so, just on the, the Irish yeah, example, which yeah. is really interesting. I think that really emphasizes the point that it's not just the mechanism which matters, is what surrounds it. And Ireland had gone through a really intensive process in the previous two or three years of deliberation about the issues before the referendum. So it wasn't just an isolated yes-no vote. It had to be thought of as I in its context, and that's why I think it got the result. Um, and as for a question, you have the like, uh, decision-making wheel where it like, breaks down how to democratize every single part of decision-making, um, which like, is kind of limiting democracy completely to the realm of ideas. Um, then once you have to like, implement these decisions, you need to start organizing labor. Um, I was wondering if there are like, uh, non oppressive capitalist ways that you've thought of democracy helping facilitate that and then also consuming what we make um, which now is based in capitalist markets um, is there any way to democratize consumption as well? well one of my colleagues at Nesta Kirsten Bound quite a few years ago uh, did this fantastic project called Everyday Democracy and they basically looked right across the Western world at democracy in many, many different fields, from the household to the workplace to consumption, and sort of measured it and, and, uh, and almost tried to um, sort of present a, a, a world view of democracy as really uh, it, uh, as ubiquitous in all of life. I'm talking about a much narrower story, but I would recommend looking at that if, if you Google it, the Everyday Democracy Report from Demos, because, uh, you know. I think it's really important to return to those questions of the workplace, the marketplace, etc. But um, I, I deliberately kept it much narrower, my, my focus. And her index um, was, was a really good, so the Everyday Democracy Index tried to then compare different countries in terms of the richness and depth of democracy in exactly the sense you're pointing to. Can we bring a mic up to one of these? Yeah. Uh, mine is very simple. Your, your point about democracies don't evolve. I think it was number four. Uh, term limits. What do you think of term limits? Secondly, campaign finance reform. These are two issues that we've been fighting here in the United States for quite a while. But they, are, I think, are an attempt to try to deal with the point you made about evol evolving. Yeah, and certainly... Um 
actually, I don't know why I cut it out. So I think probably design principle number seven is have very strong protections against the enemies of democracy. And um, one of the enemies is disinformation and misinformation. So if a, if a significant proportion of the public essentially believe facts which are untrue, that's obviously a problem. And money has always in democracy been one of the great enemies of, uh, uh, of true democracy, which is why every country around the world, or most countries, have often very strict rules to stop you know, power in money buying power in politics. Um, so my country, there are very strict rules on how much you can spend on elections, and people quite regularly you know, go to prison for, for breaching those. And, and it's so important to protect uh, in that respect. And yeah, campaign finance reform here, the PACs, etc., cetera, um, uh, is a crucial battleground. I'm not sure that's always evolution, because I think sometimes it's, uh, the world's gone backwards in that respect, had, had stronger uh, protections against uh, undue influence from uh, money than it, has, uh, than it has now. But that must be a, a design issue. And the concern, I guess, of many online, um, almost any kind of next generation online democracy is how do you protect that deliberative space from abusive ca or predatory capture or influence by strong corporate or, or plutocratic interests. Yeah, I'm never very sure about term limits, to be o honest. Uh, on the one hand, it's very healthy often for democracies to have a, an influx of new people. France is very interesting at the moment because last, when it was year, the year before, with Macron's En Marche, you know, an entirely new body of people came into the, their assembly and into ministerial jobs, and that was very good for, for France. Um, and yet, on the other hand, there is a certain kind of professionalism uh, in politics, and my experience, I've worked with many politicians, it often takes them 10 or 15 years to be any good at the job. <laughs> so if you lose all of that expertise and wisdom and judgment all the time, you may end up with a dumber system. So I, I'm very ambivalent about term limits. I don't see them as inherently good or bad. I think much more important is to have contestability so that it's very hard for anyone to have a job for life and to shape, you know, um, boundaries, etc. so you have many fewer uh, incumbents for life, and protecting against the money nexus, which again uh, reinforces that kind of jobs for life approach uh, and doesn't always encourage service to the public. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we still have a monarchy, but um, by and large, <laughs> by and large, I'm pretty much against any jobs for life. That seems to be a pretty bad way to run any institution, whether it's a business or a parliament or a Supreme Court. Or what? Or a university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Retirement's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it seemed to me that you pretty much limit your view of, of democracy or the issues you raised to just legislative and executive. And yet, you know, legislators legislate all those wonderful laws which are routinely, routinely violated. You know, it's wonderful to have the First Amendment and the right to free speech. I can tell you because I sued about it, it's hogwash. There isn't any free speech. I mean, to a very, very limited degree, but the limited free speech, is, of course, isn't free speech. And most interestingly, there is currently a mechanism to go and fix it. For citizens, you go to courts and you say, this law was violated. And most interestingly, courts themselves do not have any procedure. We are presumably entitled to, quote, unquote, due process. But in practical, my own experience, practical experience shows there isn't any such thing. Judging is strictly arbitrary. And interestingly, when you sue judges, and that's going to interest you greatly, they're going to say in response, we have the right to act, quote, unquote, maliciously and corruptly. It's case law. Federal judges have the right to act, quote, unquote, maliciously and corruptly. Moreover, it's in the interest of the public and not of the corrupt judges that it be so. So I am just curious, what mechanism do you envision for the public to control the courts? Because now courts are deliberately judges are deliberately chosen for life so that they're, quote, unquote, independent. I don't know what are they independent of. But they're certainly independent of due process, and they're certainly independent of any accountability 
to the public, the only way you can get rid of a judge is through the appearance of impropriety. Impropriety itself doesn't matter. But the appearance of impropriety, if he was drunk, if he was on drugs, you can get rid of him. But if his decisions are total bogus, in total violation of any notion of due process, he's just there. So how does that work? So Great, great question. And one of the, my failed projects when I worked in government was trying to have transparency on judicial decisions and a feedback loop so you could see what had happened to their decisions so they could learn. But this was seen as a shocking idea by the, very, the judges, and so we got nowhere on that. Um, I think the law is, is uh, so I'm, I'm in sympathy with you, because I think the law is a field incredibly ripe for the new models of collective intelligence. It's odd in a way the jury long predates modern democracy. The idea that you should be tried by your peers, you know, randomly selected 12, that goes back to the, the, the Middle Ages. And, you know, is, is, is a, is a, there's this sort of deep tradition that the law has to be in some ways rooted in the people if it's to be legitimate. And yet its forms have hardly evolved at all since then. The book I mentioned, Gnomon, uh, is really interesting because it's, it shows a completely different vision of a sort of collective intelligence model of the law. Uh, as I mentioned briefly, almost every judicial decision, administrative decision, you know, deciding on a, you know, a, a refugee's status coming in, is decided by essentially jury-like bodies deliberating transparently with the role of the judge being more the kind of curator of that group rather than being a classic judge. So there's a very, uh, there is a good vision of a possible future which in a way answers your question because you have much more transparent uh, uh, accountability. The judiciary though are a bit like democracy and they do not have an inbuilt capacity for R&D and evolution. It's not clear whose job that is. There definitely isn't money for it and so it rarely happens. We are about to, in a, 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 later this month in fact, start a really interesting project with the main legal regulatory body in the UK uh, running an innovation program on use of data and AI to empower small businesses and the self-employed. Um, but it's, it's unusual because there's, this very rarely uh, happens. So, great question. I think it needs lots of work and just electing judges is probably, you know, which I know you do a lot of in this country, we don't do any in my country, it seems to me often the worst answer because it is not necessarily amplifying the intelligence of, of the system. Have you got an answer on this? Because you're probably heavily involved in it. I had a point of information about okay. the election of judges, okay. which is it's not, not common in other places, but in many jurisdictions in the United States, judges are not only elected, they're elected in partisan elections, yeah. which one could say would be a democratization of the judicial process, but in fact leads to all kinds of trouble. Yeah. So, so I, I think this is a field, if any of you know of really good, um, hard thought through visions of a possible you know, how a judicial system would work in the year 2040, 2050, making full use, again, liking Gnomon, not only of collective intelligence, but also they use AI to, um, you know, as it already happens to a degree, to try and predict different behavior patterns, etc. I think this would be a, a really useful topic. Just yeah. one follow-on thought. I mean, there are all kinds of inbuilt processes in systems, such as appeals courts, yeah. which function as a way of iterating on a judge's decision, yeah. Yeah. just as processes for recertifying yeah. uh, legislation function as yeah. ways to rethink legislative decisions. There is some tension, though, between the fact that those processes tend to be slow yeah. on the framework of the human, of the human lifespan. Yeah. You know, a human life is not that long, yeah. and those recertification and appeals processes can often take a decade or more. Yeah. So there's something around the, the not around speed versus complexity, yeah. which we don't have great solutions around. Again, Gnomon is really good on this because it's a really quick, they make decisions in sophisticated, complex ways, but quite quickly. And as you say, there are many parts of the world where judicial processes are so slow that the law is essentially uh, inaccessible. In India, it's a 10-year minimum to get most uh, cases dealt with, and in the long run, yeah, we're all dead. Did you, what do you have? Hey, greetings. Oh. <laughs> uh, 
I, I just wanted to share um, a project I am indirectly invo somewhat involved in that goes to one of your points, which mm -hmm. um, is being currently run by a network called Democracy R&D. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a agglomeration of different organizations, the mm -hmm. New Democracy Foundation, the Jefferson Center here in the, UK, in the US, mm -hmm. the um, folks in the also in the UK running citizen juries, so something that will speak mm -hmm. to our common interest in mm -hmm. citizen deliberative processes. And the project we have been pitching to different um, parliaments around the world mm -hmm. um, basically revolves around the notion of the having a watchdog of mm -hmm. sorts for democratic process renewal. Mm -hmm. So the, the process we are discussing with them is having something akin to a citizen jury or a citizen assembly being convened on a periodic basis by mm. the parliament itself mm. for the sake of suggesting reforms to the democratic procedures that the parliament itself follows. Mm. So we've done some inroads with, um, I'm Portuguese and uh, we've, we are having some luck with uh, the regional parliament of the Azores, the archipelago in the middle of the Atlantic, unexpectedly. Whoa. And there is also we are trying to pitch this elsewhere, but basically it, goes, it speaks to at least one of your points with this, this notion of can we build into the system, geekily enough, right, in systems thinking, can we build into the system a watchdog thread of sorts that will lead it to be on the watch out for renewal opportunities? Yeah. There, there's a surprising amount of momentum, again, around citizen juries in, in the UK. They, they sort of come and go. And uh, at the moment, for the first time ever, actually, the national government is funding a whole series of citizen juries over the next year. And there's a, a, a project which maybe you can advise trying to create a citizens' convent, constitutional convention which has the backing of quite leading figures in all the political parties um, to, over two or three years, really review every part of the design of the constitution. My, my sad anxiety about it is that I'm not sure how well-suited the sort of tools they'll be using are to the detailed design of a second chamber and issues like that. So this is very live, the question of what kind of tool works for what kind of task, especially in the kind of uh, reflexive loop you're talking about, where you have a citizen jury reflecting on how well the democratic system itself is working. So I almost throw back the question to you, what bits of those questions are most suitable for a jury type thing, public meetings, online deliberation, whatever it may be? It's not obvious to me what the answers are. A specific <laughs> answer. Okay, so uh, what I would add would be that uh, there are already folks working on deliberative multi-stage designs whereby, for example, the ideations, and I found your chart super helpful in the sense of having a notion that different steps of the process require different methods. It's such a fundamental insight that there are folks already trying, for example, to open the ideation stage initially to make it non not constrained to a random sample, but instead an open online process more akin to crowdsourcing, and, does f and then feeding the outputs of that process into a narrower, more deliberative, closed deliber deliberative body that would work on those proposals. Okay, well, we will tap into democracy R&D, clearly. <laughs> That would be very useful to know. Uh, who, who else would like to comment or violently disagree? My, uh, yeah. oh, oh. My, my question takes a little bit of a different turn. And that is looking at what happened in industry, software industry, and is now happening in business. And it's the move away from the manufacturing model of the 1900s started by Frederick Taylor, moving into a world of uncertainty. And are there any lessons from the software industry, which has really adapted to agile starting in the 1990s, changing the way business operates, changing, moving more from a predetermined business plan to a model of outcome assessment. Google uses it. In fact, that Google is forced to use it by its initial investor. Uh, Intel has used it. And looking at it and moving the decision making based upon what the outcomes are instead of trying to figure out what things should look like, uh, but deciding what we'd like to have happen, what we would like the world to look like of a business, and adapting the business. Those businesses that have adapted are here. Kodak didn't adapt. Many companies didn't adapt, but many companies are being hugely successful like Amazon because they have distributed decision making and a structure that might work or adapted, starting with a set of fundamental values, then developing a set of principles, and then experimenting with them, and experimenting constantly. 
So I, I, I completely agree with that. And one chunk of my career was running a strategy unit in the UK and then helping various other ones, which were essentially about bringing outcome-based agility to the everyday business of government, exactly as you described. Now, that requires quite a few things I didn't talk about. You know, one is, a, is, a, is an open process for deciding what the outcomes should be, where elections on their own are not usually good enough. But there are quite a few examples around the world of open processes of setting strategic goals. South Australia, a good example there. Oregon was a good example here in the US. And quite a few others, which are a bit like the kind of OKR model I suspect you're referring to in, in Google and elsewhere. Uh, and then, again, as, as in the best of business, having transparent iterative processes of making sense of either success or failure in achieving those goals. And I think South Australia is probably the single best example, which created a whole apparatus to complement the formal democracy to run that whole system and encourage, say, the focus on outcomes. Then within the system, you need a bit as in, bits of software, much more agile, project-based team working alongside the vertical silos, which can you know, run experiments, can run labs, etc. Uh, and what the UN is looking at this week is essentially whether they can back and accelerate exactly that kind of working around the SDGs, promoting uh, teams which can operate in a much more experimental, agile, iterative way, using data as well, but where they have the great advantage with the SDGs that the outcomes are very transparent. Those, in a sense, are set, and therefore, how can the rest of the system adapt around it? I think it's easier to answer the questions in relation to the formal operations of government uh, than it is in relation to the formal operations of democracy, which often point in an almost opposite direction. <laughs> uh, because you then, in a sense, require your political culture, your media culture, to be as interested in outcomes uh, as perhaps the people within the system. And if instead, you know, it, those really don't matter <laughs> compared to um, uh, yeah, finding enemies to fight or whatever, then you've got a real problem. I think this is one of the great dilemmas of democracy now, is that there are some very attractive, advanced, sophisticated governance models in place, but the, the dominant models of democracy are often pointing in, it in a precisely opposite direction. So I think you had a, if you want to pass the mic to, yeah. I was wondering, uh, for an additional design principle, the issue of scale and time, uh, returning back to that. So, you know, people point to Kansas and say that we didn't cut taxes enough and we need more time and more extreme tax cuts to see if it really didn't work. Um, and I was wondering what kind of design principle you could have to, you know, prevent that constant kind of pushing off of the decision and, and asking for this kind of purity in uh, information. Well, I, I don't know the, about Kansas. <laughs> I really don't know anything about Kansas, but I think you, you, it's a really interesting question. What are the, the time horizons of different kinds of action and um, decision making? And I'll just give sort of two, two bits, uh, incomplete bits of an answer. So there's a bit of theory in this book, because I, I got very exercised by that, that question. Um, and part of the theory here says that any kind of choice can be thought of as having a degree of dimensionality. One of those dimensions is, um, is the complexity of the decision. So, for example, how many different disciplines do you need to make a decision, uh, a, a meaningful decision? There's another dimension, which is how many organizations need to be involved in a strategy or a, or a project. And then the third dimension is time. How quickly do you get the feedback to know if something has worked or not? The great majority of the experiments in the collective intelligence space are very low dimensional. They're sort of single discipline questions with just one organization, and you very quickly know if it's worked or not, like Boaty McBoakface, which you mentioned. Uh, and yet nearly all the things which matter to human beings uh, are highly dimensional in all three of those senses, and therefore much more complex. Uh, and, uh, and you almost want your both governance and democratic decision-making processes to be able to distinguish between those and to then put in place the right monitoring, assessment, evaluation processes. Now, where, where that takes you with some issues, and this is, I think, one place where democracy is evolving a bit, is 
to find what are those issues which by their nature have to have decisions which are made beyond the time scale of a, of a single parliament or congress or presidency. Um, so, for example, in the UK, we set up a, you know, a, a, a national infrastructure commission to decide on 30 to 50 year infrastructure uh, strategic priorities um, with buy-in from all the parties so that those could be stuck to over long periods of time rather than just being one party. And that's sort of half working. We tried one on climate change, which actually worked moderately well, again, in setting much longer time horizons to decision making and action. And we tried creating one for pensions, because pensions policy is of that kind too. And so in a sense, these, these are entities deliberately insulated from the immediate froth of day-to-day -day politics and argument. And you could imagine you know, a few other domains where that would ultimately lead to better decisions, more in the public interest, which retrospectively would be judged to have been good, whereas other things can be very instant uh, and so on. But uh, you, you open up a really important part, actually, of democracy design, which is missing. So there's another principle, thank you, um, <laughs> to, to add in. And where, yeah, uh, again, making decisions about the physical design of a public park, that's that maybe, that's not ultra short term, but you ca it is reversible, whereas you know, making decisions on your actions in relation to climate change are generational in nature, and so was the need a different handling. Have you got a, a good answer to your own question? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I was just thinking about the how it works list, right? And you can see that like certain things have worked well, but you still want to have innovation. Somebody suggests a new solution right there. You know, we haven't discovered everything, but then that becomes problematic because somebody could just, you know, even if there's data saying that, you know, building a border wall is not going to work, for example. Um, people can say, well, we didn't build the wall big enough or strong enough or anything like that. So you still want to have that element of innovation where people can suggest new things that aren't on the how it works list, but how do you set the, the limits on those where they could possibly never be proven? Because um, yeah. you always want to be like, well, it has to be more perfect in order to be actually proven. Yeah, so th there's a big push for experimentalism in government at the moment. Uh, Canada has uh, almost decreed it. Their you know, Treasury Board, someone was talking about earlier, I think today, you know, has required almost every policy should ideally be tested first before it goes to scale. Finland has an experimental team in the Prime Minister's office. We, we in the UK are doing a lot of it, a formal experiments. And at Nesta, we run a whole network on economic policy experiments uh, around the world. Those work quite well, again, for certain kinds of issue, like when you're, you have a lot of different, um, when you can have multiple experiments with a few thousand or tens of thousands of people in each one. But there are lots of things governments do which you can't experiment like that, and a border wall probably is an example. Macroeconomics is much harder to do, you know, a series of randomized control trials on. So um, the experimental mindset has to be manifested in different ways, again, depending on the issue. Uh, and, and in some cases, you'll never quite have the certainty that your project failed because you hadn't done it deeply enough or long enough or because it was just a really stupid project in the first place. <laughs> That's a kind of non-answer to your question. Yeah, right at the back. Uh, yeah. I think it's the, the last question, perhaps. Uh, yeah, it seems like uh, what you're trying to uh, formulate or achieve is some sort of uh, abstract, absolute, anodyne uh, process which uh, presumes that if it is uh, well-crafted, that it will well lead to good decisions rather than people electing people we don't like, whether those be Trump or Viktor Orban or whomever. But uh, the more multicultural uh, these, uh, our nations become, the persistence of factionalism and tribalism and, and certain interests make themselves manifest. And let me use the example of Cynthia McKinney. And when she was uh, first running for Congress in her district in Georgia, she was presented with an oath to sign by either uh, APAC and or other Israel lobby groups. And for, to her knowledge, she was the only person coming into Congress, whether it's a, a representative or a senator, who did not sign this. And uh, because she was running to represent her constituency. And it seemed like the idea was she had to represent this other constituency and put their interests before her own uh, constituents. And so uh, as a consequence, 
uh, forces were militated against her to run candidates against her to get her out, and congressional redistricting was done to make sure that she wouldn't persist uh, in Congress. And so, um, how do you account for that kind of thing, whether it's the Koch brothers or lobby lobbyists like APAC or whomever, uh, uh, finding ways to game the system, no matter how well crafted or designed the uh, uh, d uh, electoral policies or, or referendum policies are done? Well, I, I was very, I guess, influenced by two, two things. One, one was experience. My family is from Northern Ireland, which has been through you know, a whole series of different experiences of, of acute division. Uh, and, uh, and that makes me very skeptical of claims that there's some long-run historical trend, which means we're bound to have more divided societies. Uh, and the second influence was uh, Professor Charles Tilley, who was a professor at Columbia. Uh, uh, some of you may know his work. But he, he, I particularly got to, got to know him and work with him on this question of when do societies sort of fall apart? When do they become mutually, deeply hostile, polarized, full of, of anger? And he wrote brilliantly over many, many, uh, many examples of many years and essentially showed that in almost every case, it's not some underlying structural factors which explain the outburst of communal violence or civil war or whatever else it may be. It's nearly always much more specific design features of the system and choices made by particular polit politicians and leaders either to amplify disagreements and polarize or to be bridges. Uh, and that therefore these things are much more open to shaping than the kind of view that there is some you know, inexorable logic which takes us towards division, polarization, and anger. So I really, he, his books answer your question much better than I can, because he looked at everything from Middle East, Northern Ireland, um, parts of the US, Indian cities with communal riots and, 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 and genocide in, in Yugoslavia. And um, when you've really gone through it, in a way perhaps you do end up being quite concerned about what you call the anodyne, but it is actually the design principles. How do we design our systems so they discourage leaders from being incentivized to want to blow up uh, uh, disagreements and polarize and motivate anger? This seems to me an absolutely central question for our times and is why I care about this stuff uh, and uh, why I think it's really important not to fatalistically believe this is just the way the world is. It's not. It's in some ways a consequence of the mixture of design principles and in a sense the ethics of the people who are our leaders and both are shapeable, at least a bit. Ch Ch Charles Tilley. Professor Charles Tilley, he was a, a historian, political scientist, uh, chair of the American Sociological Association at one point and wrote many, many books on this, this question and many detailed case studies um, and what he wrote really echoed my experience living often in, well, in Northern Ireland, but also in very diverse cities, some of which went you know, down the road of mutual hatred and anger, and others not at all. And it's com totally convincing why the kind of, like Samuel Huntington's sort of thesis that this is somehow structurally, that you know, civilizational clashes are structural rather than contextual, is wrong. I'm not going to make any comment on your country. Uh, that's for you to sort. That's that's for you to sort out, not me. <laughs> With that, let me thank Jeff very, very much. Do we? Uh, do you have something in hand? Come on up, please. We're going to take. I'm going to trade. I'm going to take this one back. I'm not giving it up. Right. But in exchange for which, uh, just a little souvenir from our fearless director oh, here at IPK, just came out last week, Eric Kleininger's Palaces for the People. And let me add, Eric will be our speaker in the series about civic renewal and democracy in December, November, November, sorry. Again, next month, uh, Cesar Hidalgo from the MIT Media Lab and uh, Jose Luis Marti from Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. And we look forward to seeing you all next month. And to Jeff. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.